Okay. Well, um, good afternoon and welcome to our Global Health Tuesday webinar series and today's discussion on global health and migration. I'm Jorge Osorio, director of the Global Health Institute, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you and our distinguished panelists to what I know it will be a very robust discussion. Our Global Health Tuesday series features researchers and practitioners from the University of Wisconsin-Madison and across the world. The speakers showcase the complexity of global health challenges and the many kinds of expertise needed to address them. By sharing their experiences with the campus and Madison communities, this guest provides insights into global health, encourage conversation, and help connecting our colleagues locally and globally. Our moderator for tonight's uh, panel is Karen Solheim, clinical professor emerita and former coordinator for global health initiatives in the School of Nursing at UW Madison. Karen has conducted health-related projects in Thailand, Cambodia, India, and Somalia, focusing on meeting population health needs and building local capacity. Karen is co-founder and board director of the International Partners for Education, a nonprofit organization supporting students, primarily girls, as they obtain secondary edu education in Malawi. Please help me welcoming Karen, who will introduce our panelists. Thank you. Hello, everybody, and welcome. We're so glad you could join us today for a discussion on global health and migration. We know that's a very broad topic. It's both local and global, and um, a complex issue driven by conflict. Make it louder. What? Hey, get a screenshot of that, please. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. okay. And then All for, right. For those of you who are um, joining us, if you could put yourself on mute, it would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Go ahead, Karen. Okay, so we, we know that migration is a complex issue influenced by conflict, violence, climate change, and economics. We confront difficult policy issues at the international level and nationally, and clearly the impact on health and well-being of people who are forced to migrate is significant, and we saw um, that was exemplified today with a tragic fire in Ciudad Juarez, where 39 uh, migrants lost their life. I want to just show you a slide to put the um, issues of uh, migration in context here. And that was not the way I wanted to go. Okay, so you can see from this slide that there's 100 million people who are forcibly displaced at this time. And um, that population is bigger than many countries. For example, the population of Germany is 83 million. Between 2012 and 2021, the population of people who are forcibly displaced more than doubled. And this is from various things like more armed conflict in countries such as Myanmar, where the uh, military took over the government, or in Afghanistan, where the Taliban took over. Those are just a couple of examples. Professor McKinnon, one of our panelists today, reminds us that the way we use language matters. So some of these terms on the screen um, can be dehumanizing, but they do reflect the scope of uh, the people involved in migration, internally dis displaced people, 53 million have fled their country for the same reasons that refugees do, but they're still inside their country. Refugees have international protection. They can't be returned to their um, home country um, and, and put their freedom at risk. And they have other entitlements and protection. You can see on the top right, the main countries that are source countries for people who are migrants. And on the bottom, um, the countries that host the most refugees and um, at this time. I didn't mention asylum seekers at the top of the screen, so people who have made a claim for sanctuary, but it hasn't been processed. So that just gives you some idea of the scope of the issues we're talking about today. And uh, Erica Rosales will tell us more about um, young migrants who are um, protected or ha are, have deferred action for childhood arrival status. Our first speaker is Sarah McKinnon, who is a professor in communication arts, and um, she's going to uh, talk to us about her recent um, service at the Darien Gap in, um, in Central America. 
And so that's going to give us an example of the local issues with global health and migration. Then Kai Yael Gardner Mishlov is going to tell us about um, the local resettlement um, process here in Madison. Kai is the executive director of Jewish Social Services, the resettlement agency in Madison. And then Erica Rosales will um, is the director of the Center for Dreamers at UW Madison, and that's a center that gives support to those who have DACA status so they can achieve their education goals. So with that in mind, let's turn the floor over to Sarah McKinnon to tell us about the global issues she learned of at the Darien Gap. Thank you, Sarah. Yeah, thank you so much, Karen, and also to everyone at the Global Health Institute for this invitation. So let me just quickly share my screen and then we'll get, get started. Oh, I'll stop sharing mine. Oh, okay, here we go, hold on. Cancel, let's see. Boom, boom. And let me start. Awesome, so I am going to talk a little bit about a trip that I took two weeks ago to um, the area just south of the Darien Gap. I guess it's maybe not included in the Darien Gap, but it's just south in, in a little town called Nekokli, um, Colombia. And what I want to do is to talk a little bit about the significance of Nekokli um, as we think about migration in the Americas and the contemporary current um, refugee context in the Americas. Um, and so what I want to do is contextualize the trip and also to give us a sense of um, why this space is really important and how the Global Health Institute and folks at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, myself, um, Professor Osorio and um, Aaron Barbado from the Immigration Law Clinic are beginning to do some work there. So I'll try to contextualize all of that for us today. So let me back up and give a little bit of context about Nicocli, Colombia. So this is a little town, we might say a little village, just on the north of, um, of Colombia. And Nicocli has historically been known as a, a regional tourist place. So it's a place where folks from the region of Antioquia and the area of Uraga would go to just relax and take pause. Um, but around 2021, that began to change in significant ways. Um, primarily because of shifting dynamics in migration throughout the Western Hemisphere, um, because of foreign policy collaborations, different shifts in laws, um, in collaborations between the United States, Mexico, various countries that pushed migration southward. And so I'm happy to talk about that context, the more geopolitical context in the Q&A, but, oh, what's happening? Hold on. There we go. Um, but let me contextualize the migration context in Nekokli. So before 2021, there were about 10,000 individuals annually that would move through the area that's known as the Darien Gap of Panama. Um, that shifted really significantly in 2021. Um, Panamanian officials as well as Colombian officials estimate that in 2021, that number was closer to 133,000 migrants that moved through the region of the Darien Gap to continue northward to uh, seek some permanent settlement. And I can also talk about that in the Q&A. And then in 2022, the number was even more. 250,000 migrants are estimated to have passed through the Darien Gap of uh, Panama um, to continue their journey um, northward and potentially claim asylum. Nicocli is a little city that um, beca becomes really important in this conversation because it's the primary exit point for individuals as they're leaving Colombia to begin their journey, their transit through the Darien Gap. And that is a trek that's about five to seven days on foot through the jungle. And um, all sorts of things happen in that context that uh, are really important to understand from a global health perspective, but also just from a humanitarian perspective. 
to give you some context here for where this is located, so we'll see on the um, left-hand side of the screen the kind of the picture of migration in the hemisphere. Um, Colombia becomes a really important um, entrance point and exit point as people continue their their trek forward and or onward. And then on the uh, right-hand side of the screen, you see queued in a little bit more to the town of Necocli. Um, across the Bay of Orova are these two little points, Capurgana and Akandi, which are two the stopping points. So folks who come to Necocli will then take a boat across the bay to one of these, uh, these little points. And this is where the journey through the Darien Gap begins. So this is where the, the, the journey on foot through the Darien Gap begins. To give you context of what the Darien Gap is, is like, um, it's important to recognize that the Pan American Highway that goes from Alaska to uh, Afghanistan this is I'm not Afghanistan, I'm sorry, Argentina. This is the only point where it stops. This is the only point where there's not roads through that. And so really the only way through this, the, this space is on foot and it's a very dangerous um, trek and um, there's lots of stuff that happens. I, again, I can talk about that in the Q&A um, if you'd like to learn more about the, the context of the Darien Gap. So for Necocli, the, uh, the primary countries of exit or the primary nationalities that they see migrants um, arriving from are Venezuela, Ecuador, Haiti, and Cuba, but also as far away as China, India, Afghanistan. Um, you can uh, see on this map from the, from the humanitarian groups kind of where they've tracked uh, the movement from, and so you can see this is a really vast map that then arrives in the little village of Necocli. And in terms of demographics, primarily it's uh, men who, adult men who are migrating, but increasingly humanitarian groups are seeing significant populations of women as well as children and adolescents who are making the track. A lot of families who are actually arriving together um, and so that's a, a dynamic that is also important to consider. Okay, so I'm going to move a little bit into Necocli, the little town itself. So folks arrive in the little town of Necocli usually by bus. So the bus station is important. There's a park that's important, but the boat docks are also very important. You see on this slide that the, the boats are kind of billed as this like tourist, um, you know, this adventure, you're going to go enjoy the beaches, but, but so there's this sense of like, oh, this is beautiful. There's this sense of, you know, tourism, but it's not at all that. And so this is the image of what, um, of what the trip through the Darien Gap uh, will be like as people arrive. The, the boat is approximately an hour long. So the trip um, from Necocli to Capurgana is about an hour long. And then from there, that's really about the last point where there's humanitarian um, resources for folks as they move through the, through the jungle. And so this stopping point in Necocli is really important because it's where you can get all of the stuff you might need. You can, you know, get medical attention, any last th thing before you're about to take this really dangerous, hard journey on foot. Uh, in Necocli, you see lots of people waiting for the buses or for the boats. And so that's one of the things that happens. Once folks have enough money to buy a ticket on the boat, they'll line up and, um, and wait in line for the boats. Um, the boats go between about 8 a.m. to 1, 12 or 1 in the afternoon before the seas get too rough. And you see folks waiting with all, you know, their life's accumulations, right? Like waiting to, to board the boat. In terms of the groups that are working in Nicocli, um, once 2021 um, came about, there are a lot of really important humanitarian groups that came in to, to provide assistance, protection and prevention for 
uh, migrants as they were deciding to continue the transit. So you'll see on the slide uh, list of the organizations. I met with many of these organizations. And so what I'm reporting from you for you today is really uh, a summary of what I learned um, as I was meeting with some of these organizations. One of the really significant ones that I spend a lot of time with is the International Organization for the Migration, or IOM, or in Spanish, OEM. And OEM is really interesting because they do a lot of different things, but one thing that they do is they have a mobile health clinic that's set up in Nicocli. So you see this uh, van that is set up. Um, on the, I guess it would be on the right side of the screen, uh, one of those doors opens up and it's a dental clinic. So folks can get dental assistance, basic dental assistance. And then another door opens up at the, the back of door and that is a physician. So they have right in this little van, um, both um, dentistry as well as um, like physical care. Um, there's also mental health uh, services that are uh, associated, and the IOM estimates they see about 20 people a day at this clinic. The Red Cross also has two clinics that are stationed in uh, Nekokli, who also see folks um, on those elements. And then the Red Cross also has one last station in Kapurgana. Um, when they cross the boat, but that's really like the last, last, last um, uh, support that folks provide before they uh, move into the jungle. Um, there are gender-based protections as well. This is something I learned a lot about uh, in terms of what's happening. So in on this image, what you see is a fanny pack that's provided to women, and it's basically kind of dis described as like gender protection fanny pack. It has all sorts of um, material in that can that can be really helpful along the journey. So I can talk about that also in the Q and A. And in terms of the public health needs, uh, there were so many um, as I was receiving information and really learning about the context for immigrants and refugees. Um, so I've listed a few, and I'm happy to talk about also these elements in the Q&A. And then finally, the, the last point, which is our project. So this boils down to what the collaboration between Global Health Institute, the Immigrant Justice Center, and the Department of Communication Arts will be. Um, and it's really threefold. So we are going to be working with the IOM to implement legal clinics and information about U.S. immigration law so that individuals who are potentially intending to seek asylum eventually in the in the US they can receive information and consultation about that process before they decide to make this very dangerous journey as well as other possibilities for uh, resettlement or permanent uh, residency that might be possible so that's something that we're beginning to implement and think about how to implement with IOM um, I believe, and I don't want to speak too much out of turn, but I think we'll also be working with uh, assistance with rapid testing and uh, tropical disease surveillance to help with that dynamic because it's such a precarious shifting context in terms of public health in Nekokli. We'll also be working with the organizations, I believe, to help with information and communication uh, infrastructure to get information out there about what the Darien uh, Gap journey is, but also um, information about you know, these services that might be available. And then lastly, and this wasn't something that is a part of our project, but it was something that the organizations mentioned, so I thought I would bring it to our attention here. Um, there's a need for language and translation services. So the organizations are doing a really nice job with the big three, so Spanish, English, and French. Um, but lesser uh, used languages in this hemispheric context um, are more challenging. So there's a pretty significant uh, community of, of migrants, refugees that speak Mandarin, right? And so like translation of that or Arabic, like these are things that they're just struggling with. And so I thought I would bring it to our attention. Uh, and that is the end of my um a presentation. So I will turn it over to our next speaker. Thank you all.
Karen, Karen, I'm sorry, you're on mute. So sorry. Sorry about that. Sarah, thank you. That was very interesting. And um, it is uh, encouraging to think that UW-Madison has a presence there. And it sounds like some really um, useful services for people who are making this journey. So it's going to be really um, interesting to see how it unfolds. So thank you. I noticed one of the agencies there is HIAS. So that is one of the major resettlement um, agencies in the US um, and Jewish Social Services is connected to HIAS. So now we'll hear from Kai Yael gardner Mishloff, who's the executive director. She's got a long history of advocating for vulnerable populations, refugees and others in communities in Milwaukee and beyond. She has a background in, in public health and political science and has a, a rich interest not only in the refugee population, but trends and disparities overall. So thank you, Kai. Welcome. Kai, you're on mute. Okay, sorry. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. So I'm coming to you today from uh, JSS in Madison. Thank you so much for including me on this panel. Um, thank you to everyone for working on these issues, which are very, very important in our community, not only locally, but globally. So the mission of JSS, we are a agency that is guided by Jewish values, but you don't have to be Jewish to receive services here. The point of our services is to empower uh, communities that are very vulnerable and to assist them in self-sufficiency. And we do that guided by Jewish values to welcome the stranger, to assist folks who are sick and vulnerable. So um, I wanna, uh, up on the screen right now, I'm displaying some of our programs at JSS. In the green, I've highlighted some of our refugee resettlement programs, um, some of them being reception, reception and placement, which is the 90 day rush that our refugees find themselves in when they're relocated here to refugee support services, which are services that are involved assisting folks with getting jobs, with becoming acclimated, to preferred communities, which is another fund that we operate under, which provides assistance to clients who need intense case management, to asylum and humanitarian parolee services, which is something that we refer out to currently, to our, um, our partners, Silk, and also CMC, the Catholic Multicultural Center. Now, in addition to our refugee resettlement services, we also have other departments within JSS that provide social services or acclimation or spiritual support. And keep in mind, as you're looking at this chart, um, there are some services that we provide in other departments that are also provided in refugee resettlement, and sometimes we collaborate. So for example, as we're providing housing for our refugees, we may also be providing housing for other vulnerable populations. So a lot of our social workers and case managers work across systems, and refugees are welcome to any of the programs that we provide. So next, next specifically within our JSS resettlement program, I want to say that we started actually in 1989 when we resettled our first family from the former Soviet Union. Um, but since then, in 2016, we became an affiliate of HIAS, the Hebrew Immigrant Aid Society, which is the oldest refugee resettlement agency in the country. I believe it's 130 years. Um, so a long, long history. And we were very proud to be accepted as one of their affiliates. We are the only uh, agency providing refugee resettlement services in Dane County in this area. So since 2016, we have provided services. If you're looking at this pie chart, to communities, refugee communities, displaced communities from all over the world. As you can see in the blue, the blue section right here, the majority were coming from the Democratic Republic of Congo. Our next largest population would be the Afghan population. And then, but as you can see with the numbers that we also have taken in folks from other areas such as Iraq, Rwanda, Syria, Somalia, Burma, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but right now I would say our biggest populations are from Afghanistan and the DRC and also from um, uh, Iraq. Here's a regional breakdown. 
um, that I think is very interesting. So as you can see, um, for the fiscal year of uh, 23, 2023, meaning from October 1st to um, currently to March 15th, that's not the entire fiscal year, but these are the stats that I have right now. This is the breakdown of folks that have been settled in Wisconsin. As you can see, the majority of folks are settled in Milwaukee, um, Madison, uh, Fox Valley's next. But for Madison, we settled about 46 people since October of 2022. And then as you can see, there is a breakdown for Madison arrivals of languages of where people are coming from. So you, as you can see, the largest language is Arabic. Um, and then next would be Swahili. Um, and then, you know, next uh, French Sangha, um, Pashto, Dari, et cetera, et cetera. So the journey of a refugee is very arduous and long. Um, it's a partnership between the UNHCR, Homeland Security, U.S. State Department, all of the VOLACs, meaning refugee resettlement agencies, and the affiliates. Um, uh, by refugee VOLACs, I am referring to the nine refugee resettlement agencies that are based in D.C. And every week, it used to be at the height of refugee resettlement before um, the Trump administration almost destroyed refugee resettlement. But during that time, before that, um, every week, the nine, the nine VOLACs would meet and they would dole out uh, cases to their affiliates in various states. Um, so usually it was based on if there was a community already in that state or if that uh, affiliate was able to take uh, communities. Refugees often don't know what state they're going through. That's very important for us to remember. And sometimes it takes years. I've worked with families who are in refugee camps for 10 and 15 years. So some of the health and social concerns that are common in refugee communities, as you can expect, trauma due to instability, migration abuse, inadequate or previous health care where there were gaps through the migration due to political instability, due to infrastructures that were tapped out, inadequate previous dental care. And we all know how dental care can affect your overall health. Um, and then problems when you come here due to Medicaid reimbursement and long-term oral care neglect and health literacy gaps. We have a lot of folks who may not have health literacy, may not may speak indigenous languages that um, are not common um, to the interpretation that we have. So I want you to know that refugee screening is a collaboration between all of the partners, private partners, refugee resettlement agencies, local clinics, and the healthcare systems. Now, some of the acclimation challenges, uh, these are effects on outcomes. People are resettled in communities where there are pre-existing disparities, food deserts, high crime neighborhoods, inadequate housing, inadequate public transportation, and employment problems. So refugees are facing the same barriers but new barriers because of the language differences. And also within 90 days, they are expected to be self-sufficient. So imagine being dropped on Mars, not knowing the language and being able, you know, being expected to navigate all of these complex systems that we, that I feel challenged by, even though having a long history working in social services. So I wanted to give you, I just wanna point out, we've got some case examples. We don't have enough time to go through all of them, but I wanna give you a common one. Uh, family K, family of six with dis disabled relatives residing with them, meaning they came over with disabilities. A rural family, the head of the household was a farmer, mom was a goat herder, no formal education, they have to adapt to city living appliances, head of household is a chain smoker, mom is a diabetic, and chews betel nut, which is common and uh, the relatives need a lot of assistance. So that's like one example. How can, how can we as providers provide services to assist people in acclimating and navigating systems and address the healthcare, um, assist, uh, healthcare support and social uh, service support that they need? Um, another one I wanna say, because we're getting more cases like this, clients who are LGBTQ, who are traumatized, were in prison in their home countries, coming for traditional cultures. So they're coming here and we're trying to figure out how can we connect them with their community, but at the same time be sensitive that they may be coming from a community that has very conservative um, viewpoints on sexual orientation. And so we want to connect them to the community, but we also want to um, protect them from anything that they may need you know, support regarding. And we want to be able to, to acclimate them in, in American culture, but we want to address some of the mental health needs that they have at the same time. 
So I want to re remind us that care providers here at JSS and all of our partners, we work with UW Health, with Group Health Collective, et cetera. We look at social determinants of health as something that's very important. We can, If you cannot, if you don't have transportation to get to your healthcare appointment, that's going to be a problem. Um, and we also look at the resilience and also what refugees have left behind. What conditions do they find themselves in when they arrive here? Social isolation, accessing a culturally appropriate care, systemic barriers that we're all aware of, and then dreams of what their life would be like in U the USA is drastically different than reality. Food back home versus food here, language. And the biggest thing that I want to point out is affordable housing scarcity in Dane County. And we can address that during the Q&A. This is something that we are really, really trying to partner with folks on. It's very difficult to find affordable housing. If you your only income coming in is going to be $658 and you've got a family of seven and you're working a minimum wage job. So what can we do? How can we use evidence-based care, flexibility, outreach, and build on that resilience, but also address these gaps in our healthcare, healthcare and social service system. Thank you very much. If you want more information, there's a, you know, a code here, QR code, but I'm very happy to be here and talk about how we address these disparities together as a community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kai, that you've given such a, a, a thorough picture of um, challenges faced by people that come to Madison uh, for resettlement and told us about the profile and um, the many issues that we can all um, turn our attention to. So thank you. Thank you. Now I'd like to um, turn it over to Erica Rosales, the director of the new Center for Dreamers at UW-Madison. Um, Erica is very engaged on campus, I can see, doing human rights work and other work with 4W and um, the School of Education, the Global Health Institute, and she also is uh, describes herself as an immigration activist. So Erica, we're very um, eager to hear from you and um, hear about your journey and experience as well as the center, so thank you. Thank you so much, Karen, and um, thank you for inviting me and everyone that is here. Um, I am going to share my screen. Hopefully I can do so properly. Um, just let me know if you can see my full screen. I believe it is loading. Okay, here we go. Okay, perfect. Well, hello everyone. Um, so my name is Erika Rosales and I am the director at the Center for Dreamers, as um, Karen mentioned. I also work um, at the Wisconsin Center for Education Research, where I am a diversity and inclusion specialist. And I am also a 4W Director of Immigration and Human Rights. I've also done a little bit of work for the Global Health Institute um, a couple of years ago. And um, as was mentioned, I am an undocumented immigrant and I'm also a DACA recipient. So for those of you who are not familiar with DACA, so what DACA is essentially is a program um, that was created about 10 years ago actually. Um, and it was placed during the Obama administration. Um, because it was placed through an executive order, it has been continuously challenged. And unfortunately, it will most likely be terminated. Um, at this point, we don't we don't know exactly, but um, there's a very high likelihood that it will be terminated um, just because of how the program was created and the challenges that it has had ever since um, it was put in place. So um, the program is actually not a pathway to citizenship. What it actually does is um, it allows us, um, those of us who have met the requirements, to stay in the United States um, and have safety from deportation. Um, as you can see, the requirements are pretty um, strict. <laughs> um, and there are some that if you do not meet um, or did not meet at the point when you applied, um, and you could not prove, for example, that you were physically present in the United States on this very specific date and have some sort of physical evidence, you could not be admitted into the program. So um, 
as I mentioned, this is not a pathway to citizenship. We do not get a green card. We do not, we do not have anything other than protection from deportation. And it also allows us to have um, a driver's license, a social security number, work authorization, and then the ability to apply for advanced parole. And what advanced parole is, as awful as it sounds, it's actually a permit to be able to travel internationally um, with very strict requirements. So for example, um, for work purposes, for humanitarian purposes, um, and education purposes, and you have to provide very um, substantial information and um, be able to definitely confirm that you're going for these very specific reasons. So, um, and unfortunately with um, DACA as a program, um, while it does provide some um, nice benefits, it, it, became, it was closed, meaning that it no longer allows for new applicants. So even though there are a lot of folks out there who could benefit from the program and who are essentially eligible, they're um they're not taking applications or they're actually they're not processing applications they're taking applications and they're taking people's checks but they're not processing the applications unfortunately um and so and, and again you know ever since it was created um since the beginning of its time it um continues it has since the beginning it has uh, been in a lot of struggle and it continues to have pushback and it continues to have a lot of folks um, from mainly conservative views to push against this program that even though it has demonstrated that it has worked um, really well because um, it allows those of us, you know, who have been part of it to not only stay, but also flourish in different ways. And because of the strict requirements, we have to be in our on our best behavior. We also have to have education and we have to have some um, other things that, you know, oftentimes are not required for, for other programs. So, um, and one of the requirements actually um, has been to um, be a child. And I'll talk a little bit about that when you enter the country. But um, just also so you, so you get an idea of what this looks like within our state. Um, as of September 2022, um, Wisconsin had about um, 5,900 DACA recipients. And so um, those are the people who have been in the program and have reapplied and have gotten accepted. Um, that number keeps going down, um, not just in Wisconsin, but actually nationally, where the DACA recipients number keeps decreasing. And um, it's for multiple reasons. So one of them being that um, some hopefully have actually found a pathway to citizenship, not through the program, but um, mainly because of uh, a spouse who's a US citizen, and then they have had the ability to apply for um, a, a green card or or be able to um, have status. There are other people who did um, allow their DACA to just um, expire and they did not renew for multiple reasons. Some people are scared to renew um, and to not know what's gonna happen to them. Um, some people can't afford it because every time that you reapply, you have to um, pay the fees. And then also you might have to pay um, attorney fees um, for me in the past, I've paid, I would say about $2,000 every year and a half, every time I have to reapply, which is a lot of money. Um, and so uh, again, unfortunately, you know, the, there is a lot that could come off of this, but the program is not sustainable and it's also not, um, not the best for anybody who's part of it, but also for those that are that are eligible and are not able to apply. And so, as I was mentioning, one of the requirements for the program was um, that you had to come in as a child to the United States, not necessarily undocumented, but that um, that was my case. I came into the country un undocumented. I came when I was 12 years old, um, essentially from the um, 
economic collapse of my country. So back in the 19, late 1980s, early 1990s, a lot of um, U.S. and Canadian companies started shipping their factories in um, overseas over to China. My dad was a supervisor at General Electric and his company got shipped over. He received a severance and a goodbye. <laughs> and so um, 10 years later, he was still unable to find a job and um, unable to provide for the family. My mom was the one that had been providing for the most part. Um, and so he decided that it was time to do what a lot of folks were doing back back then, which was come to the U.S. And typically the thought was coming to the U.S. for a couple of years, go back and, you know, save some money, go back and um, be with a family. But over time, folks have found out that that's not sustainable. So people make the journey and then a lot of the times they stay. So my dad was here um, and because my dad was here, unfortunately, my sister and I could not get a passport because both parents have to, have to sign off. My mom had a visa. So that meant that um, the option of us coming together undocumented was not feasible as a family if she was going to come with us because since she had a visa, she had to come on her own. Um, and then we had to come separately. Um, I was 12. My sister was nine. And we um, were very fortunate to have known the smuggler. Um, we knew, it was somebody that the family um, knew for many years, and we knew that this person was a trustworthy person. Um, that's not the case for a lot of people, especially children, especially girls. Um, you know, the, the list of vulnerabilities add on when it comes to children, especially if it's girls and if they're um, unaccompanied. But um, again, we were very fortunate and we made it safely to Madison, Wisconsin. We came straight to Madison. Um, we had been here ever, ever since. Um, my dad actually chose to move back to Mexico about 10 years ago because it there's no driver's licenses for undocumented folks. And so aside from all of the things that are very challenging. Having something as basic as a driver's license um, is essential. And so just going to work and home um, is not <laughs> ideal for somebody that wants to have a life. Um, so my dad chose to move back. Um, then my sister at three weeks ago moved back to Mexico as well, um, her and her family. Um, and then my mom is retiring and she's also moving back. Um, and so, um, you know, it seems like a lot of folks are moving back. It's um, life in Mexico is very different. Um, however, living living undocumented is extremely, ch oh, I'm sorry, um, it's extremely challenging. And for that reason, you know, a lot of people have have chosen to go back, even though it's it's also hard to live there. Um, and so for that reason, you know, I have um, been very involved because it's very personal. I have been heavily involved in immigration rights, um, activism, and doing local and national uh, work, protest organizing, um, my work with the Global Health Institute. I also did a long time ago research on um, detention centers for children back before we knew that there were detention centers for children. Um, and so I co-wrote a grant with Aaron Barbado, who is the director at, the, um, at IJC, the immigrant um, Justice Clinic um, at the law school at UW Madison. And so we received this grant to essentially support DACA recipients um, who are students in any part of the state of Wisconsin. And so we provide legal services with the support of um, the Immigrant Justice Clinic. We do legal clinics so folks don't have to pay for um, attorney fees. And then we also have social services and educational career resources as well. And then we have this wonderful program that we created. Um, it's been very challenging because it's I'm the only official staff member. <laughs> so, and then I have another job, but I also have the, the support of um, a part-time student who uh, has been very um, essential as part of this program that we created. And then also a professor from Edgewood 
So the three of us are part of the steering committee for the missile program. And essentially the missile program is a program that allows DACA participants, DACA recipients from Dane County to be able to go back to Mexico under advanced parole. So we created an educational program so that folks can go back to their home country. A lot of them have not been back since they came here when they were six months old, when they were three years old, when they were one year old. And so they don't have this memory, this connection with their home country. Um, and so they're able to go back. We had our first cohort um, at the end of last December and in January, and we're planning to go again with another group of 17 participants in, during the summer. And it was an amazing experience for them as a group because, you know, there's the sense of being undocumented and finally being able to go back to your country and reconnect with, um, with family, with land. Um, and so, yeah, this is a very, it's a very special program and we're very happy to have folks within our community to be part of that. And we only open it up to Dane County because there's such a high interest that we would just have to turn people away. Um, and I'll just say la lastly, I know that I, I believe I'm over my time. <laughs> so I'll leave a lot of, I'm very open about my, um, my personal story. So I you know, invite you to ask me any questions during the Q&A. Um, the last thing that I will say is that the Center for Dreamers, unfortunately, we received the grant and unfortunately it's a grant, which that means it's going to end. So it will most likely end in October. Um, the, also the Mexico International Study Opportunity for Learning Program. So the MISOL program as an additional part. So we've been um, asking folks for funds. If you all know anybody who's willing to support this amazing program, please send them my way so that we could um, support DACA recipients have this amazing journey to their home country. And yeah, I appreciate you all being here and feel free to contact me with any questions. Um, and then again, um, I'll, I'm very open about my story. So I'm happy to answer any questions that you all have during the Q&A. Erica, I want to thank you. You have shared so much. Um, you've really illustrated um, uh, the role of policy and how difficult that is with uh, for DACA recipients in an ongoing fashion. So, and you shared your personal journey and really this program that lends support to um, people across the state. So, thank you. Thank so. You. We will open it up to questions now and feel free to use the chat or raise your hand or just jump in there. And um, I just, again, want to thank um, everyone for their participation. And, um, you know, from the three of you, we've learned more about this broad issue of global health and migration. We've learned how local leaders on campus and the community are involved. And you've raised questions and perhaps given us some ideas for the future. So thanks again. While people are thinking, I'm happy to start for a question. <laughs> Let me start with Erica. With the policy issue with DACA, that is so tricky. And is there anything that um, we as citizens or in our roles, work roles, can do to advocate for this program? Definitely. Um, oftentimes, people don't understand the power that they have <laughs> and that when they call legislatures, they have to listen to people they literally I've been um over to Washington DC in senator's office um sometimes some of them very friendly some of them, some of them not as friendly but all of them have to listen to their constituents and so when people call when they send an email they they have to take that down um as part of their job so I really I invite people to speak up especially those that um you know, our citizens and that can advocate for others. Uh, sometimes those of us that are undocumented, um, obviously I'm very open about my story and I'm, um, I've been willing to take the risk of being deported if anything was to happen, but a lot of people are scared and rightfully so. And so I think that those of people who don't have to fear deportation, those people who don't have to fear getting arrested and, you know, being in the forefront, definitely, should um, and can use their voice for that, um, especially locally, because and it, it goes up, you know, it, it, if people are feeling supported here in Madison and in the state, then I think that it can go up the ladder. So yeah, thank you for that question, Karen. Thank you.
So anybody in the audience that has a question, I'd like to jump in to uh, talk to one of our participants or panelists. Karen, I, I do. Uh, Jorge Osorio, and I want to thank you for um, um, doing a great job moderating the, 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 the webinar, but also our panelists. You know, what I think this shows that really uh, migration is a very complex uh, subject that requires a multidisciplinary approach um, from many different angles and disciplines to solve this. And here in Madison, where we think, you know, we are so isolated, but it really can touch all of us here, you know, in Wisconsin. So I think my call will be, can we work together as a multidisciplinary group, you know, that we are, we have such a great university with expertise in many different areas. And with all respect, I, I didn't know that we had the Center for Dreamers, I didn't know of, of the great work that you are doing the work that Sarah is doing with Erin and, and Kay, the work you're doing with different communities coming to, to Wisconsin. So I think this is the call for action for us to, to be a little more integrated into the activities that you are doing. Um, getting people to volunteer to do things, what can we do to, to, to face this? Because this is a reality, you know, this is gonna continue to happen. Uh, displacement and forced migration is gonna continue to happen. But we really are in a, you know, we're a country of migrating individuals, you know, so what can we do? And I think I throw it to all of you, you know, just who wants to jump in to say, what can we do from your point of view to, to address this? Great question, Jorge, thank you. And Karen, it looks like we have a couple questions in the chat. Okay. Yeah, uh, I can read one here from uh, from from Sue Guzman. Um, have any of you heard of any research or work being done about the migration of workers within the U.S. from urban to rural areas due to COVID and healthcare and services being made available to them? Sue, would you like to add anything to your question? Thank you for that question. Okay. Okay. Does anybody have any responses? It's not research that I'm doing, uh, but I know a colleague of mine in Chicano Latino Studies, um, Armando Ibarra, does a lot of work with uh, with uh, immigrant communities in Wisconsin. And so he might be a, a great point of connection toward that question. And But in terms of healthcare and services, that I, I don't think is his uh, point of investigation or research. Probably Kai maybe has a better um, sense of what those uh, healthcare services might be, be um, in the state of Wisconsin. You know, I would say that if some, you know, it gets a little tricky. So especially as you move into rural areas, um, as far as access to services, um, it seems like there's more, things are more centralized in urban areas. If folks are, you know, I'm concerned about folks who may not have status, who are living and working in rural areas, what their access to care is and what support is available for them. I know that um, most of the research I'm familiar with um, is related to labor abuses um, of various communities, especially um, immigrant and migrant workers um, in um, various uh, factories in urban areas and also in outlying areas. Thank you, Kai. Um, looking at the chat, Kai, you had an um, early question. Would you like to answer or ask that? Just ask it online sure. or out loud? Sure. I, I wanted to ask Erica, first of all, um, if a DACA recipient wants to study abroad, if there are any constraints, study abroad in a program other than the missile program? Um, that was one question. And the second is, what support is available for DACA students at the university? Yeah, thank you for the question, Kai. So as I was mentioning, there are um, very specific, very specific criteria for advanced pro, right? Um, and one of them being education. So travel abroad, study abroad programs are essentially one of the ways that DACA recipients could travel. Um, the only thing that gets tricky is dates. So for example, um, it's taking right now about five months to process advanced pro. Um, so 
right now we just submitted the applications for our next cohort, which is going to happen in August. Hopefully we made it on time, but sometimes that varies. So whoever, if a DACA recipient is looking into um, a program, they would really have to start looking one semester in advance to really start getting all of their paperwork and making sure that um, they have support also from um, the program coordinator um, so that they're able to receive all of the information that they have to send to immigration or to USCIS. Um, the other constraint might be financially because the application for advanced parole is $575. Um, if they're going through an attorney um, to review all of that, um, that might be an additional cause. We have been supporting folks who, with, um, with that process as far as looking at their um, applications um, with the support of the Immigrant Justice Clinic. And then the other piece would be um, if there, uh, there have been any legal issues um, since they have had DACA. So for example, if they have um, an, even a traffic violation. As DACA recipients, we can't even have a speeding ticket because that might work against us. So I would say that those are some of the issues that are constraints. Mainly, I think the, the financial aspect as well as the finding the program and find, or finding the way that um, folks are able to provide substantial information in order to for USCIS to say, okay, this is a legitimate program and the timeline works and people are able to um, get that granted. So for example, for my for myself and the program recipients, we had to provide a lot of documentation. We sent some heavy packages so that USCIS could grant it easily. Thank you, Erica. Mm -hmm. The next question is also um, for you, and that is how is the Center for Dreamers, Dreamers funded? Sure, um, so it's actually through a grant. Um, it is a two year seed grant through the Baldwin Foundation. So we received one of the larger grants for $110,000. Um, again, it covers 50% of my salary. So we stretched it to, for two years. So I'm only at the Center for Dreamers for 50%. Um, uh, but since it's a grant, then it that means that it, the Center for Dreamers is not institutionalized. So um, once the grant ends, then the the work at the center unfortunately ends as well. Thank you. You know, there's two comments about um, services for migrant workers from um, from uh, the Family Health La Clinical Mobile Migrant Services. And a comment about um, lack of resources for uh, in Baraboo for translation, let, a, let alone refugee resources. And then a question for Kai, and maybe considering the timing, this might be our last one, but this is from Sarah. Um, and she's wondering about mental health challenges Kai sees when uh, in the refugee community in Madison. And is JSS able to offer services to address mental wellness? Should I answer that question? Yes, please. Okay, yes. thank you. Thank you for that question. That's such a, a, an important, appropriate question. So we see a lot of trauma. Um, we do not see uh, the trauma immediately often, um, but in partnership with our the healthcare providers that we refer out to for the initial uh, refugee health screening, uh, clients are screened for um, behavioral health needs. And we, at this point, uh, depend on their primary care providers to refer them out within their respective systems for support. What we are doing right now, because we do not provide behavioral um, health specific services via um, a therapist at this point, this is something that we're looking to expand into. So right now we're really uh, providing psychosocial groups where issues might be addressed or may come out. So for example, we have an Afghan women's group. We also have another group that a lot of our Congolese communities uh, participate in called our MHPPS group. So in those groups, that's sort of addressing some of those needs, but it's that's not where we're going to end. That's just what we have at this moment. But that is a gap that I see uh, behavioral health services for refugees, especially given the trauma. We're also uh, participating in a project 
um, to provide behavioral health services to refugees that's going to start sometime in the summer. Thank you. With, I don't know if anyone knows, uh, Dr. Sebastian out of Milwaukee. He's well known for his work with uh, refugee and other communities. Thank you. Thank you, Kai. Um, Katie, are, would you like to follow up with uh, comments about next steps with, with uh, Global Health Matters? Um, while you're thinking about that, I would like to ask Sarah a question. I know uh, we may go over just a bit, but Sarah, you had some uh, personal engagement in the Darien Gap just recently. And I, I was just wondering how any um, comments on how that trip just influenced your perspective about global health and migration. Yeah, I mean, I think it just reinforced a lot of what um, I've already think about as I've and I've been studying and thinking about immigration, asylum, context, and U.S. foreign policy as it is implemented in um, Latin American context for a long time. So much of what I saw really uh, reinforced a, a lot of my thinking about geopolitics and foreign policy. But what I will say is that I was I was really impressed by the uh, intricacies of collaboration amongst the human humanitarian groups that are working in Nicocle, just the just the nuanced ways and the minute ways in which these various organizations are working together to make sure that individuals have access to the basic needs that they might you know have before they uh, continue the transit northward. And so that was that that stuck with me. And I've continued to think about that, yeah, as I uh, as I've come back to to Madison. Well, thanks for sharing your yeah, insights yeah, and observations. Uh, yes, I think we need to conclude. Is that right, Katie? Yes, I would think so. And I apologize for not having my mute button uh, um, off. So I will go ahead and share my screen. And thank you again to everyone um, for participating. This was a really lovely conversation. And I know that the conversations will continue. Um, I'm going to go ahead and try to share my screen. Here we go. Um, hopefully... You can see that. Um, we just wanted to recommend um, two items. Um, one, um, there is the fourth annual Refugee and Immigrant Family Community Resource Fair that's happening at Milwaukee High School of the Arts um, on Saturday, May 6th. So we wanted to make sure folks were aware of that. I know Kai had mentioned um, some of her resources and connections in Milwaukee. And then, uh, we would be remiss if we did not share our symposium. And I know Jorge, if you wanted to share a little bit more about our Global Health Symposium in partnership with the Office of Global Health over at SMPH, that'll be on April 4th. I think we are out of time, but I'd like to welcome everyone to come to the um, um, seminar next week, the symposium. And it'll be a great evening um, to share with you our views on global health. Thank you. And I'd like to thank everyone, I think, especially Karen and all the panelists and all the members in the webinar for being here today. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.